back. Our guest tonight is one of the most popular politicians in the country. Please welcome the Governor of California, Gavin Newsom. Um, how are you, Governor? Thank you for being here. I can't imagine how busy your day is. So we really oh, appreciate you making the time. Now, I can't help but wonder, Governor, I, I've heard a rumor that you, your children cut your hair. <laughs> is this correct? If it is, they have done a sterling job. Unbelievable. A few weeks ago, I looked like Jeff Spicoli. So, I mean, these guys are masters. The only, you know what's the amazing part? I got four young kids. The oldest is 10. The worst part about them cutting my hair is they charge me, uh, oh, which is really? remarkable. But you know what they charge me? With V-Bucks for that damn video game Fortnite. Oh, uh, no. So, you know, it's a, it's a twofer. I got to keep them off the screen. They know how to manipulate me. That gets them back on the screen. Uh, but uh, they got a little work to do on on uh, on practicing uh, the social distancing when they are cutting my hair in the future. I think they've done a good job. Give us a side to side. Let's have a look at this. Look at this. Look at this. They've, they're, your kids are under 10, right? It's literally, I have not, and it's actually true. I have not gotten my hair cut except from those four spectacular, but <laughs> challenging children. Well, they've done a great job. Now, uh, how are you doing? How are you holding up? I'm doing fine. I mean, obviously all of us, just all of the challenges we're facing all stacked up one after another. Uh, clearly, we, uh, we're all looking forward to not getting back to normalcy because I think we have to recognize, particularly on the issues of racial injustice, social justice, we don't want to go back to the way we were, but we sure as heck can't get through this pandemic fast enough. So uh, it is a trying time for everybody. Now, I want to talk to you about the pandemic. You were the first U.S. governor to issue stay-at-home orders. But COVID numbers seem like they're on the rise here in California and even more so across the country. How concerned are you about this? We're, we're very concerned. Look, at the end of the day, California is many parts but one body. But when I say many parts, the size and scope and scale of California, its population is larger than 21 states combined. So when you talk in terms of California, you have to talk in terms of the regions in California. Some are seeing declines, some are seeing stability, some are seeing some of these increases that you're referring to. In the aggregate, our positivity rate, which is the total number of tests, total number percentage that have tested positive, has remained fairly stable. But we are seeing parts of the state where you're seeing some big increases. And so it's more like a dimmer switch for us. We've got to toggle back and forth and we've got to be very thoughtful about where we are in this process. Same time, uh, we do want to continue to move forward, but in a safe manner. Let's say it continues to spike or, you know, we're all using terms now that none of us were using four months ago when we talk about second waves and things like that. What would it take for you to consider another stay at home order? I think to start seeing a sharp increase in the positivity rates, the percentage of people that are testing positive, to see a big spike in hospitalizations and ICUs. Uh, we took the time, look, we were the first state, as you said, to advance a stay at home order. And we think that saved lives, but more importantly, perhaps beyond obviously life saving, was giving us time to prepare, uh, not just to prepare for the second wave, but to continue to process through this first wave. We're still not out of the first wave. Mm. And to prepare by providing ample uh, capacity within our hospital system, uh, alternative care facilities, appropriate protective gear and the like. California is very well prepared at the moment. But again, we, if we start to see spikes over a consistent period of time, uh, that's when we'll start putting that dimmer switch and start pulling back. Uh, do you feel like the hospitals in California are a lot more prepared now and ready to deal with such a spike should it happen? Yeah, I woke up this morning and less than 6% of our hospital beds that are available for surge are currently being utilized. Uh, so that's a number that gives you some confidence that if we do see a spike, we'll be able to absorb it. But again, that's in the aggregate. You have parts of the state where you're seeing a higher utilization of hospitals, higher utilization of ICU beds and ventilators. And that's why we have to provide uh, more support in a targeted way, uh, in a very strategic way. And so, again, I, I'm, I, I'm confident we can work our way through this. But as you mix, as you reopen the economy, as people are demanding, 
uh, and we all understand is necessary uh, more broadly, not just from an economic perspective, uh, but also from a health perspective. And we can get into issues of social determinants of health, the issues of poverty, and the issues uh, of getting preventative care, which is also part and parcel of a reopening strategy. Uh, we have to be open to argument, interested in evidence. You cannot be ideological uh, about these numbers and these surges. Now, in the midst of this, of course, everybody is, is focused on uh, police brutality and the calls to reform the police. I know that you've just been on a listening tour in your state. What have you heard from business owners and local leaders whilst you've been on this listening tour that, 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 you, that has resonated with you? I mean, the, the, the fundamental point uh, that is made over and over again, the black community did not create these conditions, we did. We own that. Uh, we have a value system in this country uh, that values a certain people over other people based on the color of their skin. And that's been institutionalized for hundreds of years. We've got to own that fact. And we've got to own up to our responsibility to dismantle structural and institutional racism. And the worst thing we can do, and the thing I heard very clearly, is be patient in this moment and go back, as I said at the top of the show, go back to some semblance of normalcy. No one wants normalcy. We have to reform and we have to demonstrably prove, not just assert, that we're willing to do it in real time. And I'm seeing progress, you're seeing progress across this country, but it has to be sustained over a period of time. So how do you do that? Because I think one thing that lots of people worry about is like everything you've just said, and I, to be clear, I completely believe you, but people out here that are watching feel like, well, this is just what, this is what I see politicians say in the aftermath of this. This is just lip service. Like, yep. how do you activate that actual change? How do we know that this will feel different? Right, so two things. One, demonstrably by changing laws. But, but just because you change laws or advance a program, you don't necessarily solve problems. So we also have to change hearts and minds and the culture, change the conversation. Uh, we're having, but also be need, we need to be held to account. Uh, and folks need to recognize that in the past, we've met moments through symbolism, not substance. Uh, we've sort of bought our way out of the news cycle by getting into another news cycle. We zig to zag the next tweet for the president and the next crisis. Uh, and we ultimately don't fundamentally reform uh, the systems uh, that we have built up over decades. So look, all of us, uh, will be judged, but more importantly, perhaps, ultimately judge ourselves to the extent we meet this moment head on by changing laws first and foremost, and then working on the cultural change we need to ultimately advance to prove that these reforms were meaningful in the long run. So how do you, how do you make massive changes in, for like the training of police officers, for example? which I'm sure is something which is talked about. How do you activate those changes? You fund it, you write checks, you put money, resources, you hold folks to account. You're transparent about what's happening at the local level. At the end of the day, localism's determinative. We can sell down a vision from Washington DC, you can sell it down here in a state as large as California, but it's actualized, it's manifested at the local level, local law enforcement agencies, local police departments. And that's where the transparency and accountability comes in. But you have to finance the training. You've got to fund it. You've got to increase your budget to make sure we are training 21st century community policing strategies and not just changing laws and not following up with that critical component. And that is making sure that the people that are responsible for the application know what they're doing and how they do it. And number two, you got to change the way we recruit law enforcement for law enforcement. Yeah, we've got to we've got to find people that are appropriate to the needs of the moment, uh, and I think that's also a foundational point that's not often talked enough about uh, in this moment. I mean, some 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 good news, uh, which I know that you will you will see as good news. Also, it's Pride Month right now, and this week the Supreme Court ruled in favor of employment protections for LGBT uh, people, those communities, considering the Supreme Court has a conservative majority, were you expecting this ruling and what did you think of it? Well, I, I thought it was tremendous and it's, it's testament to our capacity to change. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and look, I, I know it's interesting. This is an interesting bookmark. I was born the year uh, 
in this country, people forget this, in 1967, not 1927, 47, 1967, blacks couldn't marry whites in 16 states in this country. In fact, there was a, a young man by the name of Richard Loving fell in love uh, with Mildred Jeter and was sentenced to jail because he said, I do. And in that sentencing, the judge said, and I paraphrase, God, sir, God put different races on different continents for a reason. God never wanted the races to mix. And that was my lifetime, not my grandparents' lifetime. Yeah. And, and, and I say that to also make this point. Uh, that Loving versus Virginia uh, case that overruled uh, all of those discriminatory bans on interracial marriage didn't end racism in this country any more than we advanced marriage equality in this country. It didn't end homophobia. So again, changing laws is important, but we've got to change hearts and minds, our cultures and our institutions. And that's the real work ahead of us. Now, one way that you can change laws is, you know, through voting and elections and the I know that the Republican Party is currently suing you. Um, <laughs> this is right over you. Cause I you're only laugh because which, 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 I think we're up to 70 lawsuits <laughs> with the Trump administration is that, alone. Is that true? Seriously? Yeah, 70. But, there's so, but the one they're suing you about voting is your executive order for mail-in votes. Um, yeah, how, how dare we try to allow people their fundamental constitutional right to vote in a way that keeps them safe and healthy so they don't have to choose between their public health and their constitutional uh, right to vote. And that's all we're doing by providing options for people that include vote by mail. But the Trump administration, the Republican National Committee have sued the state of California and uh, will prevail. Uh, but again, no one says any of this is easy. Are you worried about the election and people being able to vote? Because we saw in, in Georgia just a couple of weeks ago, people queuing for four, five, six hours, one machine working in some um, neighborhoods, other neighborhoods, predominantly white neighborhoods, four machines working, people walking in and voting. What can you do to make sure that that isn't the case in California? Well, we're doing it with the vote by mail substantially does this. We're sending to every registered voter in the state of California. They'll have the option. They'll still be able to do uh, physical uh, voting. But again, remember, we've got a pandemic. We're not even in the second wave. The prospects of a second wave coming in the fall around election time. And you're going to ask people, manifest by those examples in Georgia and others, where you see lines for hours and hours to be out in line in the midst of a pandemic. That's unconscionable. And it's also un American because the foundational principle of a democracy is the freedom, the right to vote, the right to vote. And so we will advance that right through our efforts. Um, vote by mail. And I hope other governors and other states do exactly the same thing. Now, Governor, we've been doing a thing on the show, a late, late show and tell, where we ask our guests to share something from, from where they are that we may otherwise never get to see. Do you have something you'd like to share with us tonight? Uh, indeed, I do. Uh, so, you know, governors, governors love giving away gifts, not just promises, but actual gifts. And so Governor Schwarzenegger, was kind enough a few years ago when I was mayor of San Francisco, I came up and visited and he gave me this box. And it's a box that only Arnold Schwarzenegger could hand out. Uh, and it's a box full of Arnold Schwarzenegger's favorite movies. Uh, not surprisingly, uh, he includes <laughs> in there uh, the classics, The Godfather and, you know, the ones you'd expect, Ben-Hur, High Noon. For sure. And then his other all-time favorite, Twins. Twins. Oh, yes. Right. I mean, I know it's on your top 10 list. Uh, I've got to say, I do kind of agree with him. If I had the choice <laughs> tonight to watch Twins or The Godfather, I honestly think I'd watch Twins. Maybe <laughs> Just, it's the mood we're in. I think, I think that's the lockdown might be part of that. It might be part of that. So thank you, Governor Schwarzenegger. Reggie, do you have a question for our guest this evening? Uh, yes, I do. Tonight's question goes to. Uh, the governor, uh, if uh, if you were outside and walking around uh, the grounds outside of your your office and an alien craft decloaked in front of you and issued a message saying, how can we help? Uh, what would you say? <laughs> well, I'd want to make sure that the alien is wearing a face mask, most importantly. Mm. Uh, and so that's the message that we need to communicate right off the bat. 
Uh, and then more importantly, uh, I would hope in order to advance our collective cause of saving not just mankind, but the universe, that that alien would work alongside with me in encouraging 40 million Californians to do exactly the same. My gosh, that's the exact correct answer. It's the exact <laughs> correct answer. Thank you so much, Governor Gavin Newsom. We really, really appreciate you coming on the show. We're, we're, we're big fans of yours over here. Uh, be safe out there and we'll see you soon.